Hi, I'm Tobias, without any titles. And uh, I'm going to talk about intrinsic geometry of networks. And I already figured that um, this is quite a mixed audience, and uh, that's a challenge for a trained mathematician. But I take up that challenge and hope I can give you the message that there, are, there is geometry in combinatorial structures like networks. So what is my general research theme? It's, I mean, I'm heading the chair of algorithm engineering, but what does that mean? There's two islands within computer science, which I call theory and practice. And typically, they are rather disconnected. They don't talk to each other. And uh, I know quite a few mathematicians who actually don't like to talk to the other island. And there's a lot of practitioners here who don't want to talk to these weirdos either. Uh, so the idea of algorithm engineering, just to explain the name of my professorship, is to connect both. So we try to use solid math to understand practical problems. And now the, the question is algorithms occur everywhere. Think of machine learning, artificial intelligence. All of these modern techniques have algorithms at their core. So if you want to understand algorithms, we somehow well, have to model them. And what, are, what is an algorithm doing? Well, it takes an input and produces some sort of output. And if I look at the algorithm's research, then 90, 95% of the papers study network algorithms. So that's algorithms that work on a network. And what is the typical assumption there that this network is somehow a worst case? Because we want to have proven rigorous results. And this is why all this research work assumes that the input is a worst case network, which means it's, it's supposed to be as bad as it could be. But of course, well, real world is everything but worst case. And this is why it's important to understand the structure of networks for developing better, faster, nicer algorithms. And this is a whole, um, well, I'm standing in front of the slide, uh, this is a whole theme of research going on in the last decades. Here's a chart I stole from uh, a book from Barabashi, where you can see the frequency of the words evolution, quantum, and networks in book titles since 1800. And you see that evolution was quite popular around 1900. And quantum is still rather popular. But books or networks really rocket the sky. So networks are really an important topic, not only in research, but just like counting number of books published. OK, so this is the motivation for studying networks. But what sort of networks do I mean? Well, think of. Um, well, traffic networks, or infrastructure networks, or hierarchies, or social networks, or some um, processes, business processes, or just computer networks. All these sort of networks are technically just a number of vertices and connections between them, edges, nothing else. So on an abstract level for a mathematician, all these sort of networks are the same. Technically, because they are nodes and edges. Maybe they are directed, undirected, weighted, unweighted. But I mean, at the core, it's edges, vertices. And th there's this whole area of network science, which, um, which came up like hmm, 10, 20 years ago, that tried to study networks. So here, for example, you see the network of US airports, how, um, how well they are connected. But and this is, um, I guess, also well known. That's the network of political blocks. You can uh, observe that well, yeah, there's, there's more uh, monochromatic edges is the technical term. Um, but what sort of science can you do about this? So since half a century, uh, people have studied the so-called Erdős-Rényi model. So this was, I'm just showing a bit of, say, history. So this is the oldest model where, well, I show you not the mathematical definition, but better, a small video. Um, this is the simplest network model, which is still studied nowadays. It works as follows. You have a set of vertices. And you have one parameter, p, which is the probability that there is an edge between two vertices. And here in this picture, 
these blue balls are the vertices, and the lines showing up are the edges. We increase this probability of having an edge between two vertices over time, and then you see more and more um, connected components show up, and at one point of time, we see one large connected component, and everything collapses to one giant bubble. And this is very well understood. understood. There's, there's a lot of math and um, theoretic computer science trying to explain this model. Um, I, I skipped the, the mathematical part and now argue that the properties of these uh, most, um, well, the, the, the oldest model are not quite like real networks. Because real networks are somehow different. Think of Facebook, uh, Twitter, or hundreds of other social networks. They do look different than these networks we have just seen. So uh, think of the internet. This is a picture of the internet in 1998 with 300,000 vertices and 1.5 million edges. And why do I show you this picture? Because we see that the structure is far from regular and homogeneous. It's pretty heterogeneous. So there's a few nodes here which have very few friends, few neighbors, and there's there, there's areas here where there's very high, uh, where, where there's nodes with many friends. And this is like in real life. Think of a social network. There's people, uh, I'm, I shouldn't talk about politics, okay. So there's, 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 there's people like Lady Gaga uh, who have loads of fans and followers. And there's people like me who have very few friends. And most people are like me, they have very few friends. But there's a few people who have loads of Many, many. And this is a typical property of large social networks, but also of real networks. And the, the question now is how to model this in an abstract way, because we need an abstract model to actually prove something or to develop algorithms that are fast on such a model. And around the millennium, the first well-suited model for this occurred. This is the preferential attachment model by Barabashi Alba. That's a paper in uh, science. Yeah, it's more than 30,000 times cited. So it's one of the most cited science papers. And it's very simple. This is why I, why I like to explain this model. Because imagine like after the talk or before the talk, how things work. Um, at the beginning, there's, there's people standing around there like as, as a singleton, and maybe there's a few singletons, just like talking to themselves, watching out of the window. And later, well, they, they, they cluster together. Maybe, maybe the alcohol helps. Um, but, but, but how do they cluster? Well, depending on popularity. So if I see there is someone very popular, I might be more likely to uh, join that group. Uh, okay, so you connect proportionally to the degree of the people who are already present. So you are more likely to connect to the uh, popular guys than to the less popular guys. And this is what you observe in real life. Um, so I, I skipped the math again and uh, just, just tell you that if you take that model and assume this is somewhat realistic, you can start doing science with it. What does that mean? Let's look how information disseminates in networks. So you can say if you have a random set of uh, people um, and you have some sort of network, who knows whom, in this case maybe they all know each other, and you have a piece of information somewhere in Germany or somewhere in the world, <laughs> and uh, then you have a can say, how does information spread? Maybe if they're in one uh, building where an alarm sets, they all run over the floor and they meet each other at random. So I just say that you can define a model how information spreads and you can mathematically define a social network model and then you can study how long it takes until everybody is informed. And now the, the cool point is that you can prove 
that for the social network, it's quicker than on pretty much all other topologies. So the particular topology of scale-free social networks helps to spread information. So it's really the structure of the network which helps to spread rumors or other maybe fake news as well. But it's, it's just like the structure which helps to spread stuff. So, so even compared to complete networks, to hypercubes, to uh, circles, or I mean, all other sort of standard topologies, uh, you can prove that this is quicker. And if you don't believe it, I, I, can, I can explain it further. Uh, and also I should add, if you have any questions, just jump in and ask. I, yes? So this is the simplest version. Yes. Yes. So there, there, there's, there's no, exactly, yeah. Is this the same as in epidemiology for diseases, spread of diseases? That, that's one of the models you uh, can use to spread uh, diseases. Uh, that's one model you can, no, it's one way to model uh, spreading of diseases. But diseases can be modeled in much more complex ways, that, that you actually die or that, that you uh, get um, the susceptible or that you get immune. So there, there's a lot of more complex models, but for these much more realistic complex models, you can't prove much. Um, yes? But can't that be optimized? Whether you can be even quicker? Well, I mean, I, I, and this may go off your topic. Um, in this model, a person, you, you say it's random, you just use it as a random data, but if, let's say, you really want this item to be spread, you may actually purposely pick True. A, a, True. So you would optimize it, so it may even take even less steps. Indeed, back. so it's an adversarial assumption to say you spread uniformly among all your neighbors. Uh, yes? Pure math, I know you're skipped over this, but P, uh, minus one, if you go back two slides, it looks like P equals F. Uh, well, the P we had in the Erdős-Reni model is the probability to uh, connect to vertices. Here. It's not a homogeneous model, so you have different P's for different edges. So it's not just no. OK. Uh, so thanks a lot for these questions. So this was uh, my message. You can prove that information spreads quicker on social networks. Uh, one more example from, from the algorithm side. So this is a result. This is a model originally from colleagues uh, at Google New York here. Um, and the question is how much private information remains in the structure of anonymized social networks. So assuming you have one social network and another social ne network, you remove all the names, you just look at the structure because we want to understand the structure of networks. And then the question is whether you can still like um, see who's me in these networks. And well, you, you get the idea of this problem, well, you certainly have similar friends in both networks. So maybe this is revealing. And indeed, you can prove, and again, I, I, I skipped the technical details, that if you determine the signature of every person in such a network, which is basically the distribution of the degrees of your neighbors. So, so how many friends do you have of what degree and your neighbors' neighbors? This is a strong enough signature such that you can actually de-anonymize uh, such a network purely on the structure. So the structure alone reveals a lot. So this is all I wanted to say about the de-anonymization. Uh, this is a theorem, but ignore it. Back to the network models, because this is more imp imp important here. Uh, what are the key properties? So this is an important slide now. Key properties of real world large networks are you have this power law, power law distribution of the degrees, which means there is um, the number of nodes with small degrees, which means small number of friends is large. So like myself, I have very few friends, like many others. And there's very few nodes with a large degree, like Lady Gaga again. This is a typical property. Another typical property is that you have a small average distance. You might have heard of this uh, Milgram experiment who sent letters through the US like half a, half a century ago. 
Uh, another typical property which is important is that you have a community structure, which means if I am friend with you and she is friend with someone else, then it's more likely that I'm also friends with that someone else. So triangles are more likely than they were if all edges were chosen independently. And you also typically have one giant component. So this is what you also can observe in Facebook, that there is a path between m most pairs of people. But funny enough, also in Facebook, it's not just one component. There are actually smaller components on Facebook. And I'm wondering who these people are who are not connected to the rest of the world. So there are smaller components in Facebook, but there's one giant component. And another typical uh, feature is that there's a few nodes which are at the core, at the center. And uh, if I want to model the real world, then I want to have a model which is somehow natural. I, want, I don't want to have something which is super artificial. OK, so what have you seen so far? We saw this very classical model, which well, it didn't uh, obey any of these, pretty much. Uh, we saw the preferential attachment, which has a nice paw law, has a sm a small average distances, but has no community structure um, because the edges are still more or less independent. There's a few other models, um, but until like five, ten years ago, there was no model which makes like all these properties happy. And this is like generally accepted within network science that these are the some of the typical properties. There's a few more. And now my, my main selling point, uh, or my main argument here is that uh, you need geometry to achieve this. And um, again, I, I, I like not to bug you with, uh, with the formal definition, but the idea is you have, a, you have your vertices distributed in some geometric space and assume that two vertices are connected if they are close enough. So your vertices have a geometry and you have an edge when two points are close. And this defines your network. And the problem is that this defines your beautiful network which looks very different. Because if you connect two nodes which are nearby, you get more like a binomial Poisson degree distribution and not a power law degree distribution. So you don't get the structure you see in large uh, networks. And now I ignore the, the definition. And I want to argue what geometry you actually need. And this is funny. Um, so imagine th that you have some network, some network you observe, then my claim is that there is some underlying geometry which actually describes why these vertices are connected. And now the big question is, uh, how does this geometry look like? Because if you observe a real world network, hmm, how, how do you get coordinates to your points? And um, now I, I have heard a few physicists here in the room so let's try to argue what is the right uh, geometry. And for this, let's just assume one thing. We say that the average distance should be small. And if uh, you have taken any um, computer science uh, core course, then small typically means logarithmic. So say n is the number of nodes of your network, and l is the average distance between two <coughs> random nodes then you want that this average distance is small, which means the average distance is somehow proportional to the logarithm of the number of the nodes. Okay? Sh shout out if you have a problem with this assumption. And if you accept that assumption, uh, then you can rephrase this that the number of nodes within a ball of radius r is exponential in the radius. This is the same as this, right? You just have the exponential. And, well, how do you get balls of exponential growing size? Well, if you think of the Euclidean plane, like, uh, I should move my left arm, um, if this is a two-dimensional Euclidean plane, 
and you have a, have a point here. How does this ball spread? Well, quadratic. And in this three-dimensional Euclidean space where we are standing, then here a ball, I really should have used two hands, then a ball <laughs> spreads cubic, right? Um, in a spherical geometry, so on the, think of the Earth, uh, you spread one minus the cosine, and in a hyperbolic geometry, you can look this up on Wikipedia, uh, the, the ball grows as a cosine hyperbolicus. And now the, the cool thing is that the cosine hyperbolicus is actually more or less an exponential function. So my argument here is, if you believe me that average distances should be small, then we need exponentially growing balls, which means you have to uh, ignore Euclidean geometry, you have to go to some uh, curved, negatively curved geometry, to some hyperbolic geometry. At least I see a few faces nodding. Uh, so this is the physics argument. And if you like physics argument, I have one more physics argument and then come more pictures. Um, so the, the other physics argument is, if you have points in, a, in some sort of geometry, Euclidean, spherical, something, and you distribute your points uh, on this uh, geometry, then what you typically observe, look at the airports uh, in the world. Most natural things are power law distributed. So the size of airports, the, the size of companies, the, well, not the size of people, um, but like most natural phenomena have a, a power law di distributed. So if you accept that the sizes of vertices are power law distributed, and then you accept that edges uh, follow Newton's law of universal gravitation, so how much they like to be uh, connected to each other, then you effectively get a hyperbolic geometry again. So very naturally you derive the hyperbolic geometry. Okay. So now I convince you that hyperbolic geometry is cool, and now I can use this to define networks. And how do these networks look like? Well, we live in a hyperbolic geometry, which means our expansion in space is not polynomial, but exponential. And then again, we distribute points uh, in this space and connect them when they are close by in this geometry. And this gives us a network. And why is this interesting? Because this was the first network I saw embedded in the hyperbolic space. This is uh, all the autonomous systems of the internet. This is a paper in Nature Communications in 2010. And this really um, impressed me a lot. So the, the point here is that you can embed the internet such that 3D routing works nearly per perfectly. So 3D, uh, 3D routing means you route in the direction where is your target. And if you can embed the internet in this space and then 3D routing actually uh, mostly finds shortest paths, this means that the intrinsic geometry of the internet is apparently hyperbolic because otherwise you couldn't find such an embedding in this space. And you can also embed other things like E. coli, e. coli metabolic networks um, or the world traits uh, actually lives in, on the sphere but can still be nicely embedded in the hyperbolic space. So there's, there's a lot of things you can, this is the embedding in the hyperbolic space and it matches that the closed points are uh, connected. And so, so you see that real networks do live in this space. And so as a mathematician, you can prove a lot of properties of these networks and can enjoy it. But um, that's not all, of course, because uh, you can now uh, use this model and can explain stuff. So you can say, uh, given some network from the real world, I can compute an embedding in this geometry. So given 
give, you give me some network and I give you back the geometry. And then you can use this to find structures which are apparently similar. You, you, you have a new semantic of this network. And I skip forward. So you can not only go from the network to the geometry, but you can also go from the geometry to the network. So of course we can generate such networks and that is uh, relevant uh, for all sorts of experiments. Because if you believe that this is a realistic net uh, network model, it's great to have an efficient way to generate these networks. Um, you? Yeah, so one of the things that we talked about or that you mentioned early on is this worst case scenario thing. And then your example of Facebook where there do exist like clusters of people that are not connected to the rest of the world. This kind of violates the scale-free assumption that you have actually like a separate, completely unconnected group. Does this still work for those cases where it can generate net, like sets of, of networks where there is a giant component but there are still these like single? Yeah, that, 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 that's a good question. Uh, so in this uh, preferential attachment model, you always have one connected component because you always attach to what's already there. There's no chance to get lower order, um, second uh, smallest, third smallest, and, and so on components. That doesn't exist there. But here in this model, if just this, this, this radius you set as a parameter where you connect, then you get disconnected uh, components of whatever uh, size and number. So you have this parameter where you connect this, this threshold and then you can, can get exactly this structure. Um, so I could show you, an, I, I can show you one embedding since you, since you ask, um, of the Amazon recommendations. Uh, so I take 300,000 products from Amazon uh, and use the edges uh, or between two products that are uh, recommended uh, together. So they are supposedly similar. And if I embed this network into the hyperbolic plane, then I observe that similar products, so the ground truth is what product category is the, uh, is the product, uh, actually get on the same angular coordinate. So I do find meaning in this embedding. Um, so just to, to answer your question, uh, does, that, does that reduce your risk? Is that, what's the ultimate goal here? Here, in this example, it's the demonstration that we can solve this pretty ill-defined and hard problem of mapping an, a network without uh, any geometry to this hyperbolic space such that within that hyperbolic space uh, edges are present only between two close vertices. And this is, this is relevant for information visualization, for understanding the, the, the I mean, here obviously I actually know the product categories, but I can rediscover it. So if, uh, if I hadn't known it, I would see new structure and insights in this network. Um, could you elaborate on the, the natural properties? Um, I didn't have time to fully absorb it couple of slides earlier, is that like the vertices between the hyena, the arctic wolf, and my spaniel, or like were you talking species relationships? And let me know? let me double check whether we are uh, talking about the same thing. So you mean this natural? Like natural model, okay. Yeah. I, I I thought organic like stuff like is in popular in the right, U.S. Um, no. Okay. Why did I say that? Um, you can easily come up with hundreds of models that fulfill these properties but are super artificial because you just define, I condition my probability space on having this, 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 and this. You can do that. Then you get a, a distribution over all networks and, well, mathematically it's a model or it's a distribution of, of networks but it's not interesting. You want to have something which is clean and nice because nature is always clean and nice. Na nature is not complex. Nature eventually boils down to simple things. And I believe that this, uh, this geometric view on networks is a at least a good answer right now. So this is why I say natural, just, just to, to, to remind ourselves that we, we shouldn't just come up with something arbitrary. Yep. Why would you're working on to the whole field of AI and how they should be thinking about 
got information sets and networks, and I get back to this notion of prediction, right? Risk. Yes, yes. Uh, so we do a lot of uh, work in artificial intelligence, um, but here the, the main goal is understanding algorithms. And for understanding algorithms, we have to understand what we want to do with these algorithms. And if most work with algorithms works on networks, we have to understand on what networks we work. And then when we understand what is a decent model of a network, we can tune our algorithms to work well on that model and hope that our model was good enough to actually has, have similar properties as the real world, because then our algorithm also works well on the real world. So, so this is this is the, the aim here. Well, the, going back to that Amazon thing, even though Amazon doesn't give the numbers out, very few people make recommendations in the total universe of Amazon. And the people who make recommendations make a lot of them. So there's like maybe, let's say, 15% of the people who buy stuff on Amazon might recommend it. But they tend to make more. So I maybe every time they buy something, they'll say, oh, this is fantastic. So my question is, it's a bad data set. Just as, that's, a, that's an observation. But building a network on that, not even going into the AI part, means that you're compounding the felony. So what this, this network is, a, is the sub-network? Is a, uh, what would you call it? I totally agree that you shouldn't trust all your buying decisions on Amazon reviews. Uh, but I didn't mind that problem here since uh, this is really more a sort of demonstration that given some real, real world data, you can discover the structure which you didn't see beforehand. So that's the structure. I can also embed the Amazon, uh, this, this Amazon recommendation graph in some other geometries, but there I see nothing. But if I embed it as good as I can in that particular hyperbolic <laughs> geometry, I suddenly see structure. And this is, this is just a, a, a supporting argument for me that this is the true geometry also for that particular uh, real network. So I, I, I totally see your issue with, with Amazon at all and Amazon recommendations in, uh, here, in here specifically, but uh, it's, it's, it's I, I don't, I don't, yeah, I, I just take this for granted. So, um. so two questions maybe to clarify a little bit. So are these, rec are you connecting the products if the same person comments, recommends both? Or are you, if they show up as this person, like the recommendations from Amazon's recommendations? Because these are completely different things, completely different data sets that generate in a completely different way. True. It's uh, that in one recommendation, both show up. Yes, so, but then it's the Amazon's recommendation system that says the person who bought this also bought this. Yes. It's not that I, re I wrote yeah. the recommendation okay. for this and then I wrote the recommendation for that. Yeah. Right, so there isn't just uh, Okay, now, okay. Okay, which I realize there are two different things going yes. on. But, but probably it works on both. But okay. you just have to see yeah. what sort of data you get, because Amazon is probably not so keen to, to reveal yeah. everything, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, there, there was, oh, oh sorry, there, you had a second uh, question? Nobody else has a question. Yeah. It's a good question. I think, do you see any equitable use case for the genome, the genome map, because the special property might be a little bit different than the model you are presenting, or you see that would be too simple or too complicated to uh, Present the model to the same uh, genome. Uh, well, I, I had this example of E. coli. Um, well, I don't find it right now, but it doesn't matter. Um, but my vision is as follows uh, you take some protein protein interaction network or some, some other bi biological network, whatever is the meaning of your edges here. And then you embed this in the appropriate geometry. And then you show this to some medical doctor or expert, and he says, hmm, that's curious that these two structures are mapped so closely. Hmm, maybe you're right. Maybe I can do an experiment and double check that. Oh, yeah, there was a good, so, you know, there, there's a lot of potential edges, quadratic, uh, which, which you could study. So it's a difficult question to decide what experiment to do next. And 
if there is already some structure there given by the data we have so far, this can be a, a, a great tool to find new uh, edges or maybe maybe disprove stuff. Maybe you say, hmm, this can't be true. And then you, you double check and see, yeah, right, th this shouldn't be close together. So be because this, this, uh, the, this coordinates, this geometry has a semantic. But well, not to me, because I don't understand much about uh, uh, medical things, but the, the medical uh, expert should be able to understand what the, what the points mean. And I tell him, these things are getting close, closely mapped by the algorithm. This supposedly has a meaning, and then he can double check. So, so, so I see that application, but for this, you need the data first. So that's, that's always a hand egg thing, right? Uh, yep. I want to pray you were going to talk about, and you talk briefly, um, is it possible to find out the dependence of one elemental network on the other? And if a network is, if a network is cut off, uh, how the whole uh, world trade uh, network will change? Like now, we are now experiencing uh, with China and uh, US and China and Brazil have our soybeans. So, uh, is it possible to predict what would happen? I, nowadays, I would say there is no algorithm that is capable to predict the political future. Uh, that's um, <laughs> and well, then the future of interest rates. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's equally difficult. Uh, so, so you are totally right that, that what we have seen so far was all completely static. But uh, real networks are super dynamic. And it's a, it's a challenge to, to model this dynamic behavior. Because then new edges come into play, edges uh, are removed, or maybe the weights of the edge between two big countries uh, are getting lowered. So, so that's something you can... Um, can observe. However, I would be careful in coming up with a well, scientifically sound model uh, because there's, there's so many political things left and right. I would, I would try to be as clean as possible. So this is why I always say natural. Uh, I, I think as simple as possible and then, then this, this uh, like the, the, the big picture you can't look into the future that way. I, I, I don't see that. Um, yeah? If you can't use the model to predict so much because of the complexity and the super dynamism as you mentioned, um, can you model it to understand the sustainability of the ecosystem and generativity? Those two separate. Sustainability of the ecosystem <coughs> generativity, how do new ideas enter, right, and disrupt. But do you look at that in your model? But how do new ideas come up? Uh, well, if you give me data, I can model as a graph, I can look whether there is some underlying geometry or not. But first, I always need the data. And uh, to your first uh, claim, that uh, I can't use it for prediction. I would say I can't look into the future how the network is going to develop in the future, but I can uh, use it to predict uh, where should be more or less edges, uh, as discussed with the medical example. Because if, if I embed it and then I observe, well, I had to put these things very, these two uh, nodes very close, but there's no edge in between. This was really a pain for the, for the embedder because then there's a force uh, pushing them away. Then this is a clear sign that maybe there should be an edge if the rest of the structure actually pushes them closer. So you can use it uh, for, for prediction, but, but not time-wise. At least I don't see it right now. Yeah? Uh, this question is maybe a little bit on the edge and out there, and I hope you'll be patient with me on, on it. Uh, I saw uh, push and pull in one of your slides. And that right away reminded me of the German artist, the abstract expressionist Hans Hoffmann, who used those terms push and pull in his art and his 
aesthetic. How would you describe the aesthetics of these networks that you were, or is there an aesthetic and beauty in these networks? There's obviously a lot of aesthetic when you embed a true network in some weird non-Euclidean geometry. I think it typically looks very beautiful. Um, the push and pull here is, is really more like a technical term. The question is whether I push the information to someone or whether uh, it's getting pulled because I just receive it. So that, that's not so artistic. But I believe the embeddings itself are um, quite artistic. Um, uh, but I think you, you were much earlier. Uh, uh, perhaps more back to your topic. What happens if you go to a three-dimensional representation of these hyperbolics? Ah, beautiful question. We didn't talk before <laughs> about it, right? Um, so th this is a big challenge still. Because apparently uh, in Euclidean space, you can easily think of one dimension. Well, again, I have only one arm, uh, two dimensions and uh, three dimensions, and maybe four and a few more. And the same holds uh, for the hyperbolic space. And indeed, I believe that um, some networks we looked at fit better in a three, four dimension hyperbolic space. Um, but that's not necessarily a pain. I mean, you you can't think about a hyperbolic space anyway. Whether it's two, three, or four dimensional, it doesn't matter. You always look at the Euclidean uh, embedding. So uh, all, all the slides here are pretty Euclidean. Well, so you could do a, a, rot a rotating three-dimensional representation of a number of these uh, circular graphs that you showed us. Yeah, yes, yeah, cer certainly. Uh, I mean, these, these pictures were all uh, like two-dimensional, uh, but, but you can try to, to find higher dimensional spaces where you can embed it more nicely. And typically it gets easier with more dimensions, but the algorithms are not necessarily easier. In the end, you want to have a representation which is meaningful, which means two vertices that are close in the geometry <coughs> are connected by an edge and two vertices which are further away are not connected, at least less likely. So this is what you want. And then give me any geometry. I don't mind how much curved <coughs> and how many dimensions. Um. The advantage of uh, digital uh, uh, thinking is that there are no there's no limitations to dimension. Well, uh, my computer is quite finite. So uh, <laughs> it is not, not computer science. Well, yes, right, but, but the crafts we have in the first place, but if they come from real world, are finite, and my resources are finite, so, so typically I go for a finite dimensional um, embedding. Well, people are working on multi-dimensional uh, databases and discovering embedded truths that are not apparent in three dimensions and four dimensions. Yeah, that, that's, that's, the same, that's the same idea, yeah. So during the conversation, you mentioned we got on this, the topic of, of evolving graphs. Now, one of the nice things about, about preferential attachment is it's like intrinsically dynamic, right? It tells you what to do when a new node comes in. I'm a little curious about how we can expand or like extend this kind of model to that. I mean, maybe it's just a perturbation thing where you add, but then we get to this question of the, the political dynamics, which brings up the idea of signed edges, which is a slightly different kind of evolution in the way the graph works. Now, I could, I could see a way where you could add, add nodes to the graph dynamically that makes sense. But I'm curious now about how, how, like, how we model uh, negative, negative edges in this kind of space, where we're never going from like, these things are close to absolutely Perfect, negative. perfect. So well, th this is, I guess, the, the expert part of the question section. Um, so <laughs> this is the internet again, embedded in the hyperbolic space. And this paper had a like last section or appendix, I'm not sure where, where it was exactly, uh, which showed the following. They looked at the internet not only at 2010, but also, say, five years earlier. They embedded the internet five years earlier and fixed these coordinates and then tried to find uh, coordinates of the vertices which came later <coughs> between 2005 and 2010. And they observed that dynamically uh, assigning coordinates to new nodes 
and keeping the rest fixed still works pretty pretty well. I mean, like numbers. Uh, it's getting slightly slightly worse the, the probability that you get the shortest uh, route and so on, uh, but it still works pretty well. So you you could imagine that that every uh, autonomous system in the internet just has a hyperbolic coordinate and it keeps that for the rest of its life, and then everybody who enters uh, gets a new one uh, to to fit into the network. So that 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 actually works. <coughs> but but cool question. Yeah. Pushing my luck. So I'm kind of curious because you seem to be connecting like different strands of things I've been thinking about for a while. So you're saying, okay, you have this graph, you can build these embeddings with that hyperbolic of radius conditions. In the case of the Amazon recommendations, you can even map the, the distance, the radial the angle, to the, the categories of the products. Now, could you, for example, look the other way around? Because you started the, the section by saying, okay, I can put points in the plane and connect them if they're close enough in this space. For these products, you have the categories and you have features of these products. You can build a similarity matrix for these products and then start connecting things if they are within a certain distance, just like you were doing in the two-dimensional space. Would you get something similar? I suppose so. So you, you can really go uh, both ways, from the combinatorial structure to the geometry and backwards. But of course you will always lose some yeah. information. Um, but it's, it's this underlying assumption that within the geometry close things should be connected, things further away should not. And this as a maximum likelihood embedding works to get your uh, graph a geometry. But then would that mean, for example, that the number of dimensions that you need to represent this property? two dimensions, three dimensions in the hyperbolic space are connected somehow to the minimum representation of the feature space. But maybe, maybe, you, maybe you discover that actually fewer dimensions are necessary. So, so I think a lot of uh, things you observe in real world are very high dimensional, but the, they actually live on a low dimensional manifold. Yeah, exactly. so That's kind of the point. Like, could you use this kind of like a it's, it's a sort of dimensionality reduction, some nonlinear dimensionality reduction. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's exactly the favor. No, no, exactly. <laughs> there was some. Are you using distance in this? Let me give you an example. Take LinkedIn, for example. If I'm connected to someone in New York City, first degree connection, that distance is very short. A, di a connection in, uh, if I have a connection in New Zealand, the distance is very far. It's very far physical terms, but the connection might itself be much, much greater between myself and the person in New Zealand than between myself and the person two blocks away. So how are you using the term distance? Right. You are, you are thinking of distance on the sphere, on the, the globe. But in social networks nowadays, that distance has no meaning. Because you might have friends here in New York, you might have friends in Germany, you might have friends in New Zealand. And if they are first order friends, which means direct friends, they are the same friends distance. So that geographic meaning well, is somehow going away anyway. And so if I just look on your social network, so on your friends network, uh, then I don't have the geometry. And the fun part is that it's much easier to embed your or other social networks in a hyperbolic space than on a spherical space because apparently our uh, structure within these networks is much more hyperbolic than spherical because apparently you do not only have friends in Manhattan neighborhoods or in, uh, in the very close by neighborhoods. That's not how it works. If it was like that, then an embedding in a spherical space would give a much smaller embedding error but actually embedding your social network in a spherical space gives you a much higher embedding error, which means it's not the true geometry of your social network. So this kind of proves that uh, your friends are distributed further away. Otherwise, it would be quite natural um, that, that it's actually a spheric uh, geometry, but it's not. Okay, so this network is predicated that 
when there are indirect connections, you can create a direct connection, right? Say Ukraine to South Korea, for example. Mm -hmm. But then you have systems, network systems, like a river or like a tree, where you have the tributaries flowing into larger tributaries flowing into a main river. And the, and the, and the source the source where the tributaries begin uh, are not connected, same thing you have with, with the tree. We have um, a trunk to a branch to a leaf. How does that type of system correlate with this kind of system? Because it seems the applications would be different, or are there overlapping applications for those two types of network systems? This is a complete abstraction on how the internet works. Because the, the, the truth, underlying workings of the internet are quite difficult. There's a border gateway protocol which determines uh, these uh, routing tables which are updated uh, frequently and some people say that in a couple of decades the internet will be mainly busy with updating these routing tables. Uh, so the, the, the actual uh, routing is, is much more difficult. So this is why here we assume that I um, choose the path to my target just greedily in the direction which is closest. And this is an argument that if I can find an embedding of the internet in this geometry and this greedy direction works, then there must be an underlying reason for that. And I claim that the reason is that there is a hyperbolic uh, manifold within the internet or other large scale free networks that supports that. Um, so, so I completely agree that the true routing works like much, much more uh, difficult. But here I can prove it. I can prove that uh, greedy routing works nearly perfectly on that sort of uh, networks. So that, that, that's a different, different angle. So I think I'm not sure if this is off, but um, if you have... Um, if you can make the connection, right, and there's been a lot of questions about prediction, you can't get to prediction without context. So have you looked at mapping the context? Well, the, the idea is that you get the context uh, by the geometry. So you have purely the combinatorial structure and this combinatorial structure of who is connected to whom, just on a binary level with no context, no understanding, no tagging, nothing. Just this combinatorial structure of your network. That this allows you to derive semantics because this proximity and this uh, geometry gives you a meaning. So of course you can enrich this for particular applications. And if you have a medical problem, then maybe you want to, uh, to use further information that your graph is bipartite or, or some, some further information and use that. And for a particular application, that's certainly what you, what you should do. But, but here, this is super generic. I just say, give me any network and I, I give you a geometry. And then you say me whether this is meaningful for you or not. So I, I basically artificially derive that context with the geometry. Yes? Uh, time series. Hmm? So uh, you mentioned about the connections, point-to-point uh, -point relationship, but those change along with the time series. So have your model taken any consideration about the time series? I love time series because uh, everybody is talking about big data and I believe that 99% of big data is actually time series data because only if you have this a time domain, it really explodes. So this is why I li like talking about time series data. Um, here, this, I mean, networks, come on, think of Facebook, they have a billion vertices. That's not big data, right? Uh, but if you think of Facebook over the time, like in a, like one hertz, or like in a certain frequency, then this explodes and is huge data. And uh, the dynamics can be, can be seen in that model, as I discussed, that I can fix the coordinates and new nodes get a new coordinates. So within that embedding, I can see that dynamics. And I can also grow the model by 
um, shifting this connectivity threshold uh, and then getting more edges. So I can get dynamic effects, but I'm, I'm careful and try to, to avoid it at this point of time because the static effects are pretty general among all domains. But when you have timed effects, then this is super application dependent. Because in some applications, like in Facebook, you barely lose a friend. You mostly get new friends. So, so the dynamics uh, is very different depending on what sort of model you know, uh, what sort of network you look like. And this is why, why, I'm, um, why I so far mainly st uh, study static effects because the dynamic effects are too application specific and I, I try to understand the foundations first. Please. So um, I come at this less from a computer science standpoint. I have an epidemiology background, but here at SAP, I actually um, help make business cases for using graph theory in our products and helping business cases and use cases for our customers. And currently, I'm seeing that graph theory is kind of relegated to only a few use cases like fraud detection or supply chain or social networks. And my hope is that, you know, or I'm asking you, like, with this new way of applying geometry to data sets and applying geometry and looking at these connections, do you see kind of a flip of, instead of using graph theory only for a select few business use cases to where we can try to do it in I hope so, but uh, I'm a researcher and I'm responsible for the theoretical foundations. Uh, so this is really early stage. So I mean, th this, this whole embedding well, took place like eight, nine years ago. This was the first time like, it got apparent that there is a non-Euclidean geometry maybe hiding in large data sets. So uh, this, I mean, if you talk to general um, graph theory or network people, Maybe network science people, yes, but a general algorithms person might not sign that obviously this has to be hyperbolic. So this is something fresh uh, where I truly believe in because I think I have good arguments for physicists and non-physicists. Um, and so eventually this also should have a business use, but that's not my business. <laughs> Thank you, and my name is Sarah, and actually in response to the point about context. So um, I conduct a lot of social listening, but also uh, use tools like Quid, which is a tool that maps you know, venture capital uh, patents and social and news and so forth. And so it's data viz, and what we're doing is we're looking for the clusters, okay, of, of, of the geometry is looking at the clusters of, of, of like. But wondering is, have you come across any shapes or patterns that have certain kind of characteristics? Because what we're, we're trying to do is we look at the three-dimensional, maybe sometimes it's in 3D, a infrastructure of a network of social listening or maybe say patent structure, for example. I'm trying to identify if there's a certain kind of visualization that would have a certain a signifier or might be a catalytic point or have some messaging. So have you looked at that or is that even an area of science or is it different by each case, use case? InfoVis is closely related and uh, within information visualization as far as I know hyperbolic, uh, not embeddings but hyperbolic uh, visualizations uh, are quite popular. So I, I think this is, this is used. Uh, the, the, the neat part here is that this is not standard for networks, but for other sorts of data. And why is it not standard for networks? Because you first have to get the embedding. And this is a difficult uh, way to, to go from the network to the embedding. Um, but when you have that for the inf information visualization, I think the, 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 the cool part is, I don't have a video for it, um, but you can shift the, the center of this uh, embedding and use it like a um, fisheye lens and look at the parts you actually care about. So if you now say, I'm actually interested in that part of the graph where I don't see much structure here, I just um, shift it over there so that I see a lot of substructure here and the rest blurs away at the boundary of my vision. 
And I think this is a very nice way to look at data. Uh, if you can naturally, you don't zoom just like flat, like on Google Maps, layer uh, one, two, three, four, five. You, you actually everything remaps and is, is pushed outside if you move the center of your attention uh, further <coughs> outside. And I think that's a very nice way to um, to, to study large networks because say uh, Facebook, if you have a network with a billion uh, vertices, then mapping this on a screen means even if every vertex only has one pixel, you would need to have a screen with one billion pixels. Uh, maybe SIP can afford that, but normal people not. And even if it's just one pixel per uh, per node, you don't see much information because you want to have some context uh, connected to that vertex. Uh, and with this fisheye lens, which you automatically get for free as soon as you have this hyperbolic embedding, uh, you can uh, greatly play uh, with, with the data and understand what's going on there. Uh, so, so I think that that's a, that's a great way to, to, to study the data. So, so one thing I haven't said is why nature picks a hyperbolic rather than a flat surface. That is, what does it tell you about the properties of nature that it chooses this? I haven't talked with nature. <laughs> um, but for physicists, it's nothing what scares them. So for physicists, it's completely OK to look at curved spaces. Uh, although the universe isn't flat either. It's not exactly hyperbolic, but it's also curved. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say this is not natural, because being, being, being somehow, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a particular projection. Uh, so no, I'm, I'm not saying it's not natural. I'm saying it must tell us something about the way nature works. And you said it has a lot of very special properties about a greedy way to find connections. But, but you haven't said what is the process of nature that is then reflected in this sort of geometry. I think the core property which enforces us to uh, go away from Euclidean geometry is that with distance, the number of friends or our neighborhood or a ball grows exponentially and not polynomially. And this exponential growth, which you observe in real world networks and real world data, is nothing you can observe in Euclidean space. And this is why you have to go to, to, a, to a stronger curved space uh, to, to get this uh, expansion. So. <laughs> I, I, maybe, it, I mean, the math would be much nicer without this hyperbolic stuff, but it's, uh, it seems to be necessary. At least I don't know anything uh, better. So. One last question for, for me. Uh, again, I'm trying to get my mind around this, but if you could tell us how, and I know here on this floor that you see a lot of, about the 17 sustainable goals of the United Nations, how can seeing in this way uh, benefit humanity? I am quite optimistic that on the long run, and now I'm talking about centuries, uh, decades, uh, this should benefit humanity because understanding real world networks is at the core of our society because there are so many uh, well, natural phenomena that occur in networks it's our duty to understand their structure and to make best use of it. I mean, we had this medical example, which is typically easy to, to use uh, to talk about humanity. If this, uh, if this uh, such an embedding gives you the right hint to cure cancer, to give a particular example, then this is obviously useful. But right now, this is, I mean, the, the papers are pure math. I mean, it's a definition, theorem, proof sort of things. Uh, but this is uh, foundational research trying to understand what lies below the surface. And I believe below the surface is a non-Euclidean geometry. And this is 
not like uh, for, for profit today, but I'm quite optimistic it's going to be profitable also for humanity uh, in the long run. But that's, as I said, not, not my job. So, so my job is trying to understand it, to see patterns, to see limitations, but um, the, 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 the business use is then um, due to others. Do you think that the Russians are good at it? <laughs> I'm being damn serious. Uh, Are they good at it? I know Russian oh, research is working on that topic. Uh, so it's uh, within theoretic computer science or basic research, everything is public. Uh, there is no secret research. I mean, at least not that I know, because it's too secret. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think I have a good understanding of what goes on in network uh, science. And maybe in some Russian headquarter they know much more about this. But uh, I doubt it. So, so I think this is uh, publicly funded uh, basic research. Is so. that a problem? Nah, that's, that, that's not a problem. I think that's good. I uh, strongly believe in basic research. Did, um, did we give you an opportunity to finish your talk? Can <laughs> <laughs> you show us the last few slides? Uh, Without interruption, they're, they're relevant. No, I'm, I'm, uh, no, no. I, I think it's much more fun to me and hopefully also to you uh, to to take questions and to discuss. Uh, I I have more arguments with uh, like up to date machine learning methods to to convince you that not only the properties of the model are right, but also uh, it's uh, the the best model in a scientifically defined sense, but I, I think I, I shouldn't get into that at this point of time. Okay. You can read it up, send me an email, I can send you, send you more papers with more evidence. Um, yeah, just, just send me, just drop me a mail to um, get, get further pointers. Um, is there further questions? Yes. Does it make sense to ask for extremal uh, distance threshold? So let's say we fix a network and then we fix a level of error we are comfortable with. Uh, does it make sense to have, let's say if the distance threshold is too big, then it's impossible to embed. Or if the distance threshold is too small, then, and, in, and if that's the case, then what does the extremal values tell us about the network? That, that's, that's a good question and these are parameters of the embedding algorithm and I haven't defined what is, um, what is the right objective to uh, an embedding because there's many ways to say this is a good embedding so you have to define that term first whether you want to have maximum likelihood or best uh, greedy routing performance or, I mean, there, there, there's many ways to define what's a good embedding. And when you have defined that, you can, uh, def you can see this as an optimization problem, which is, of course, and be hard and terrible, uh, and then try to solve it anyway. And we can solve it with reasonable um, assumptions in linear time, or more or less linear time. And, but, but then you, you have to somehow relax the problem, because uh, it's probably hard. Okay, I, I think now you are running out of questions and I'm not uh, going to give you more technical details. I just wanted to share with you that there is more to networks than you might see at the surface. There is often geometry hidden and the geometry is a bit weird but doesn't bite. It's, it's a nice geometry. So um, don't, don't be scared of hyperbolic stuff. You might see it more in the future. So. Thanks.